Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Four Keys to Reverse Agile Scaling. I'm Jesse Bronson, Digital Marketing Manager at Constructs, and today's webinar is being presented by Earl Beatty. Earl is a senior fellow at Constructs, where he designs and leads seminars and provides consulting services on early project lifestyle practices, estimation requirements, quality assurance, contract management, software methodologies, and more. Uh, during the presentation, feel free to ask your questions in the chat box. We should have uh, time for a brief Q&A at the end. We'll be sending you an email once the recording of this is available, uh, which is usually within about 48 hours. I did want to make one quick note today about our weather. We're expecting some high winds today, so just wanted to give you a heads up in case there are any hiccups uh, throughout the presentation. Earl, if you're ready, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Jesse, and I appreciate that. Yes, it is breezy here today, is it not? Um, and hopefully our power and our connection stay up for the entire time we're together here. Um, my welcome to you as well. I am Earl Beatty, and if you notice, today is Tie Tuesday. Um, and I do Tie Tuesday, one, because I kind of like ties now and then, but two, it helps me tell at least one day is different during the week. Uh, because here, working from home, it's all sort of blending into the same thing. So I'm here to talk about these keys to reverse agile scaling, which is a kind of interesting topic. I don't think I've actually seen anyone else present on this. And the idea is here is that how we scale up is might be different than how we scale down. I mean, how do we do multiple projects on one team? In fact, my working title for this presentation was 32 projects, one team, because one of my clients was like that. They had 32 different products, and they only had one Agile team to support these 32 different products. Now, granted, these products were all really small, and some of them didn't have updates that often, but this one team had to support them all, and how do you do that? And that was sort of the genesis for this talk, or this thinking out loud. I like to call these things thinking out loud because that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, uh, Jesse already mentioned on the tech here that you can use the Q&A button to submit questions at any time. And I encourage you to do that. Don't necessarily wait till the end. Uh, just because uh, this tech is cool tech. That is, it's slightly ahead, like all webinar tech, you're slightly ahead of the curve of everyone else. Um, and so that it can churn, generate to a nice live stream. Um, but also it has pause and play buttons so that you can actually pause this presentation if you need to go out and get a cup of coffee or something and then continue on. I will have gone far ahead, but you will be right where you need to be. So don't wait till the very end to put your QA in there. And if you notice it seems frozen, it could be that the wind blew me over or it could be that you just hit the pause button somehow. So be aware of that. So what I want to think about today. Well, I really want, here's the things I want to think about. Um, I'm going to just talk about generic Alex, Agile scaling because a lot of people, when they think about scaling, they always think about the going up. And so I want to look at that one a little bit there. Just how does that work? And I'll give you a few ideas about that so that when we go to the reverse scaling and look at the reverse scaling problem, that way we, when we do that, we can start saying, okay, I can see here how the things that we do one way, how can we adapt them and try to use them to go in the other direction? And then I'll give you these four keys right? Because I promised four keys, so I came up with four keys. And we'll go through those and see how they kind of drive a good reverse scaling. I'll even give you a bonus key. And it's a bonus because it's not really a key so much as a good mindset, especially when you're reverse scaling, to remember this idea of throughput activity. And then we'll wrap up with the Q&A and all that kind of stuff. So that's what I'm going to be thinking about and taking you because I want you to be able to walk away from this today and say, OK, I have a pretty solid idea of how to do reverse scaling when I have lots and lots of products, but very few teams or even one team doing all this work. So let's take a look at what we've got here. So the first one I want to go to is this idea of generic agile scaling. And this is generic. There's lots of people who've been trying to solve this scaling problem. This is where we have one product, but we want to have four, five, six teams, or 20 teams, or 30 teams. How do we scale Agile? And a lot of people have come up with scaling things, right? We've heard a lot of these things. We've heard of SAFE, right? Or Nexus, or um, LESS, right? You've probably heard of these things too, all these different kinds of scaling frameworks. So what are they doing here? Well, we got this. This is the basic problem here. We have 
this one backlog, right, with all the things that we want to do on the product. And we have multiple teams that we need to help build that backlog because with all these teams, we need that to get the capacity out there. So how do we solve this problem? Well, generically, the way we solved it is that we've created some sort of a thing in the middle here to distribute work. And I generically call it the blob because I draw sort of a blob shape. And so we've got the blob here, right? And who makes up this blob? Well, usually, now, one of the first attempts was to say, let's have scrum masters, right, be the ones coming into this blob. Um, and it turned out, and we called it the scrum of scrums. And it turns out that didn't work that well. So I'm just going to back those back off because they didn't often know the product as well. They weren't experienced enough. And so what we see now on most of these blobs is that we're going to have, um, let me change my color here, a technical team member come in. So we're going to have one of the technical team members come in and be participants of the blob. We're also going to have the product owner come in and be part of this blob. And I like to have an architect. Because what this architect's primary job is to make sure that these teams as a whole are acting as a unison. Now, Nexus does this. And instead of having architect, they have a Nexus integration team. But SAFE will have uh, a release train engineer who's a scrum master, but also an overall architect to help guide this stuff. So someone looking over the big picture while my team members are often focused on the smaller picture. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull a story off the backlog here, and the story is going to come in. And in this blob, they're going to have to do some work of breaking that story down into either smaller stories or often even do the task kind of build up here and say, okay, here's all the things we're going to have to do to build this story. This story being something that's valuable back here on this backlog. And then we'll come along and we'll take some of these things and we'll grab a handful of these and we'll give them to those team. We'll grab a handful of these, oops, Boop. take them to this team, and the rest we'll take down to this team, right? And they'll figure out how to distribute them, something like that. And then we got, that's how we do it generically. And so we got this idea of a blob, something we stick in the center, basically, made up of the participants off and off the teams and a few others, like the product owner and an architect. You might have a chief scrum master there. And then we take these stories, we do some level of decomposition or breaking them apart, and then we hand them off the teams. In SAFE, we'll go on story, they'll only go to the story level and go to the team backlogs. In Nexus, we actually don't use team backlogs, we break them down into tasks and we build sprint backlogs and that gets distributed to the teams. So different strategies overall, but basically you got this blob in the middle. So that's how we do it generically. That's the basic generic answer. So. What happens when we want to reverse it, right? So what is the reverse scaling problem? Well, the reverse scaling problem looks something like this. This is, we don't have one backlog and three teams. We have many backlogs. And like I said, one of my clients, the highest I've seen personally is 32 products for one team. I've also seen, you know, 15 products for two teams kind of things, but mostly it's a handful of products, often in the least double digits, and one team who's managing all these products. Now, these products are often vastly different. We've got products here that are pretty big, right? We've got these big products here that actually take a lot of bandwidth. They're fairly important. But we also got little tiny products out here as well that are occasionally need something, usually don't need anything, but they want something. And sometimes you get these little middle-sized ones that don't have a lot of action, but they've got a really vocal customer who wants things really fast when they finally decide they want it. Right, so you got all of these products. And so if we were going to try to use our strategy here for overall uh, management like we did, I think we would want to put a blob in here, right? Okay, how are we going to coordinate all of those product backlogs now to the team? Well, okay, who are we going to have in the blob? Who's going to do this work of allocating? Well, here's where the problem comes into being, right? Because, well, one team member from over here doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, right? Because you only have one team. Might as well let the entire team participate, right? No big deal there. So what do we have from over here? Do we have a whole bunch of POs coming into the room? And all of them saying, here's what I want you to work on next, because 
a good PO probably should be believing that their personal little backlog, whatever it is, is the most important backlog there is and trying to get everyone to do their work. And so these people get really confused. There's lots of uh, priority shifting, lots of people being jerked one way or another. And so it becomes kind of messy and this is the problem. So the problem is how do we coordinate among all these different backlogs here, all these different products that we want to work on to get them to this one team. And that's where I've come to see to working with lots of clients now trying to solve this problem, these four key ideas that you can use to help solve the problem for you. So let's get a look at about how we might solve these. Right. So key one is one products backlog sheet. Now notice, notice what I did here, right? Right. I'm going to just see if I get my highlighter here. I made this little S. <laughs> I put an S on my product backlog, right? I put a products backlog. And because it's kind of to say, I still need a chief, chief decision maker. Right. Well, whether this is an individual or it's a committee, I don't really care, but they've got to be able to make relatively solid decisions relatively quickly. If they are going to be a committee, I have them formulate a decision making process so that they have, can execute it on a regular basis without having to decide how we make decisions. It's an individual. I also then have them do sort of a semi process, but at least it's going to be cleaner and faster because it's only one person rather than six or seven we have to do. Lots of decision making models out there. Uh, one that might work well here is one called Rapid. And Rapid just says who's responsible for getting all the work, the R is responsible, uh, who actually has to agree to this thing, who's, gonna, who's going to pee, uh, do all the performance of this, who needs to be involved in this decision, and who's the actual decider. And the difference between involved is no veto and agree has veto power, but the decider is the one who decides. So there's a dozen models like this out there, but this one might work, but you have to have a decision making process. So what I do is I say, okay, what we got back here is if we do that, if we have a chief products backlog, we might say, you know what, we're, we're, we're going to just go back to the idea of one backlog. Because if we have one backlog, we can go back to our old habit of just pulling out the next story, right? Then breaking down all the tasks of that story and start building our overall sprint backlog, right? So Scrum works pretty well this way. So having a chief product owner say, okay, I don't care about all your little bit. We're gonna put this all in one backlog. Basically what we see here is the one backlog and we're gonna have a person who decides what the next story is, right? And this works. This can work because now we're just back to normal scrum again. The problem with just stopping here though is that how do you tell the difference and start making priority among all these different stories, right? Because again, we have that situation where we have that one big one, that one 2,000 pound gorilla who's gonna say, I wanna suck up all this bandwidth of this team for the foreseeable future. So while I think this is a good first key, the idea of thinking, Hmm, how do we think in one backlog kind of world so that this team here, right, gets the clarity of what's coming up next, maybe less context switching, right, and can apply just normal scrum activities because as far as they're concerned, they're just getting a story or two pulled off this backlog at a time. Another story here. And we're just doing our normal sprint planning. Whoops, I didn't change colors. Right, and off we go. That's the idea. We do normal scrum at this point, but we still have to work a little bit on how to get that better. So take this as the first idea. The first idea key is think about a chief products backlog owner who's going to be sort of the key decision maker to help give the clarity of the stories. But we still have to give some of the way to get all those other bits in there. So the other way I'm thinking about here are virtual product backlogs. And what do I mean by that? Well, the idea of virtual product backlogs is that while I want to have one physical backlog, one store, one presentation to the team as it will, right? That's what I had back here, this one presentation to the team. I still got to account for all these different people who have different things that they want. And I'm doing this to the idea of virtual product backlogs. So here's how it works. I still have all my backlogs, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to wrap them in that one backlog trick. Right. 
I'm going to wrap them up here in my one product backlog trip. And so what does that mean in real practice? That means I still may have multiple POs down here or even product managers, right? Because often I don't have POs. I just have a product manager or a sales rep or a marketing person or even maybe on some of these small ones, just a BA who's overseeing this product and keeping it alive for a while. And that's my normal course of events. And what I still have is my chief product owner or my chief products owner up here. And they're going to have to work with these people in that decision making process. But now I've got every one of these things going their own way. And I can still go back to my old habit here of, of treating this for these people seeing as one backlog, right? And so I still get my story off here. And I still break it down. But what this allows me to do is instead of having uh, one backlog where everyone's fighting on, everyone gets their own queue. Now, why is this important? Well, because what I can do with their own queue is that each different backlog can decide their own priority of what's on their backlog. They're not fighting with any other backlogs at this point, right? They're just saying within my own backlog, what are the most valuable things to work on? And that can really clean up discussion. We'll have the fight secondary about among all our most important things, which is the most valuable of all these valuable things. We're gonna hold that off, but first we wanna give every customer its own ability to say, here is what's most important for me on the products that we participate in, right? So a virtual product backlogs allows everyone to have that conversation, move those things up, and then we'll have the secondary conversation about pulling that through. And I'll show you, and, and when we talk about pulling those through here, let's see how that works, because we can start using some of those older habits that we have on normal Scrum. And one of those older habits that I think is really super valuable here is this idea of thinking about how does a normal backlog normally shape up here? And the normal way it shapes up here is that if you look at a normal backlog, I think there's about three zones that naturally form on a backlog. And I sort of draw the lines where these dots are here. At the top is I have my high time investment. My high time investment is, as I say, I'm spending a lot of time as a team working the stories in this part. And these are about two to three sprints worth of stories typically. And what I'm doing, why this is taking up so much of my time, this is a high investment time, I'm getting these into that idea of a ready state. Right, whether you use a definition of ready or not, you should be doing the work to get these into a ready state. Now, what does that mean? Well, being a ready state, I think, means a handful of things. One is that you decide that these all fit. What I mean by fit is that you have high confidence that you can complete this story in one sprint, that it will not carry over unless you start it like the day before it ends, right? That this should be easily competed, it, completed in one sprint. And there's some fit rules that people come up with to make sure that happens. Once we decide it fits, then we size it often using that Fibonacci kind of sizing sequence. I only size things that fit. I don't bother to, I use t-shirt sizes, but I only use the Fibonacci stuff on things that fit. Because I'm trying to say, hmm, do we all see the work the same way? Um, I also make sure the acceptance criteria. Are understood and well known and achievable and uh, we can estimate on them, so I really need to have those done by this point. And most importantly for our downsizing, dependencies resolved. So LVED, right? Our dependencies are resolved. It doesn't mean that they're eliminated. It just means that I have confidence that during the sprint, any dependencies that are there will have been worked out by the time we're done. That is, I will not be blocked from completing it because of a dependency. I've resolved them either by completing the work ahead of time or getting commitments from other people that it will happen, right? So those are the kinds of things I think that we need to do to get things ready. We have to make sure they fit, that we've sized them, make sure we understand the work, the acceptance criteria is complete, independent is all. This takes a lot of effort and we're gonna spend some time on doing it. So this is my high investment time. There is some low time investment. Low time investment is a bunch of stories that we see coming up. We're pretty confident we're going to be working on, but we're not working on them right now. And we're not going to be working on them in the next couple of sprints. So we're keeping an eye on them 
And we're making sure that when we work up here in this zone, we're not doing something stupid that keeps me from doing something down here, right? I want to make sure that I'm always keeping my eyes sort of in the future, not doing the work yet, but just keeping there so I can build things out so I can take those other work in without having to rework my entire product, right? So high time here, but keeping an eye down here. The third zone, I call it the no time investment. Uh, there's a set of things that always ends up in the backlog that no one's ever going to work, right? Uh, there are bugs that aren't worth fixing, uh, features or stories that the, some customer requested that aren't really that good of an idea, right? And so they sort of float down in the bottom. And everyone's backlog that I've worked with, and I've seen dozens and dozens of these things, they have some things down here, and I call, I call them the no time zone, that they've been carrying around for months and months, or even uh, one client I was working with, five years. They had a whole bunch of stuff that had been sitting there for five years. And I said, are you ever going to do that? And they said, no. I said, well, maybe you should just archive them, right? Take them off your active list, put them in an archive somewhere, because if someone thinks they're really important, they'll mention them again, and then they'll start their process and see if they can float up higher next time, right? So three natural zones. So how does this really benefit us on the reverse agile scaling? Because I talked this idea about the virtual product backlogs. Well, we could take advantage of this kind of natural sorting. And the way I want to do that is I want to give everyone their own swim lane. Remember, because they have their own virtual product backlog, they can set their own priorities. And so each one has their top you know, one or two stories they want to have on their own personal backlog of things they want to possibly build. And off we go thing. They have their list here. But the other thing you could do with their runways is that you could start saying, as a business, and this is where my chief product owner or product owners might come in, or an executive or leadership and start saying, okay, what kind of pie shape do we want to give them here? And you can start thinking about this and say, wow, product one, that's our big revenue generator. I mean, that, that counts for a big chunk of revenue. So we want to give that 40% of available bandwidth over a given period, not necessarily every sprint, but I think on a quarterly basis. So let's put this at 40% per quarter, right? And the product two, that's a pretty important one. <coughs> Excuse me. But maybe not my biggest generator. So let's give this one 20% per quarter. But after that, I'm only looking at 10% per quarter, 8% per quarter. And then uh, down here at the low level ones that hardly everything, I'm going to say, you know, 1% per quarter. And what are we doing here? We're basically saying, OK, product one, product two, you're our biggest ones. You get to choose up to, of our capacities, if theoretically 40 hours or 400 hours, you get to choose 40% of that capacity or whatever it is, right? So you can start saying, add up your stories, your bits here, until they get to about 40% of the capacity. And what's more important is that once we do that, we can then start funneling this into the high time, right? Yeah, I'm in Washington State, and for you in Colorado, this has a whole different meaning too, right? We can follow them in the high time, the ones that we're breaking down into either smaller stories or almost even tasks sometimes as we invest our time as a team. Because this could give us time to get a little feeling for it before we start pulling in. Because remember, this is two to three sprints ahead. So what we're doing is that we're doing from the low time investment saying, what are we going to move up to? We start analyzing these, breaking them down, getting them into that ready state. Right? So the team's going to be dedicated some time to getting this in the ready state, which means they see this work coming. And this lowers the context switching sort of being jerked around because they get to play with it. They can organize their time a little bit because they're not actually working on them yet. They haven't pulled these into a sprint yet. This is just getting them into that ready state so they're ready to work on, i.e. giving us two or three sprints headlong into what's going on. And we can see what's queuing up in these individual queues for the different product items based upon their allocation. And it can even start giving us a longer ramp view of this as well. So this idea of the idea of virtual product backlog sort of having their own runway, their own priority within their own backlog. And then we can start having some budget allocation scheme and then using our high investment time to start bringing those together to a common view to the development team so they can see what's going on ahead so they don't feel so jerked around, but they can then organize their own time. And when it comes time for sprint planning, these are all not new. So that's another great 
skill we have here is this idea of let's create virtual product backlogs and then budget them. A third key is to break the work down. And I, this has obviously always been a part of Scrum, and so it's really not so much key in in for reverse algebra scaling, but it becomes especially important here because one of the things we have to deal with when we're dealing with reverse scaling is that not everyone on the team is familiar with every product in the same way. You're going to have some people that are more familiar products than others. So how are we can break down the work? So when I talk about breaking down the work, I'd like to do it a couple different ways, talk about two different aspects of it. One is that whenever you're running any kind of sprint, right, you should see four types of work in here. Four types of work, and I've listed them up in here, and they have even different color stickies. Let me just tell you about what these four types are. The first type here is the selected product backlog work here. The selected product backlog work is the work that's coming off that backlog, the stuff we've been pulling off the high investment zone. And the work on this stuff is actually gathered, um, gated by your velocity, right? This is where you want to use velocity. Velocity is all about how much work should I pull in to do detail planning on and break it down into all these tasks, right? So I pulled in a bunch of stories up to my velocity and I broke them down into tasks. And that velocity was covers this one but it's not the only work I do on a project. There are three other types of work I need to leave a little room for too. The second type of work I call backlog refinement work. Backlog refinement work is the work we were just talking about getting things into that high investment zone, right? So this is getting stuff ready. And what is getting stuff ready? What do I have to do? Well, to deal with dependencies, including technical dependencies, I might have to run some spikes. So a lot of this work is spike work or research work or just spending time doing the refinement, right? This is work that I'm doing to get stories ready. And this is going to be time boxed. By time box, I mean we're going to set amount, a certain amount of time to do this. And it's going to vary a little bit because early on when we're just trying to get our two to three sprints going up, this might be a relatively large time box. But once we get rolling, it might be a pretty small one. And we might have to adjust a little bit, but saying, hey, we're gonna make an intentional amount of work here, and we're not gonna let it fill up our entire sprint. It can't take more than 20% of our capacity overall. We're gonna time box it at a normal 5% capacity or something like that. That's how much time we're gonna spend on refining work. All this refined work will be later reflected in over, all this refining work will be later on reflected over here when we actually pull it into a story, but this is just getting into that ready state. Okay. The third type of work down here, this is development environment work. This development environment work is work we're doing as a team to make our development better. If you're doing DevOps, this one might be more automation of your tests, more automation of your pipeline, bringing in a new tool, researching a new tool. It's not doing things for any product, it's just making it so that when you do bring in work here, you're faster, you're better, you're more able to execute it because you did something down here to make your environment better. And like, the overall product backlog, this is time box two. But unlike the other one, this one tends to be pretty fixed. Well, this one's time box does vary a little bit because you need to keep the two to three sprints worth a long. This one's pretty fixed. And it's often around 10%, something around that. That says we're going to take some tax and just do our work. So notice now, not all of our work is on product backlog work. We've got work to get product backlog work ready, and we got work to improve our development environment so that when we do take on work, we're always getting faster and better. But there is this fourth one, and those I left empty holes here too because this is unplanned work. This is work that you did not plan to do, but you have to do it anyhow during the sprint. The one of the products goes down and it's a production issue and you have to bring it back up. That's unplanned work. You've been asked to go attend a meeting with a client for a new potential client that you weren't expecting to do in the next two weeks. That's unplanned work, right? So unplanned work is the things that you do not plan to do during the spring, but they tend to crop up and we need to leave a hole for them as well. So in a sense, this is not really time box. This is calibrated. Because it turns out for a lot of organizations, their amount of work that they have that's unplanned that keeps coming up is relatively consistent. And so you can calibrate saying, well, we need to leave about this much every time because that's what happens. 
now what if I don't use it? Well, if I don't use it, I got three other kinds of work I can do, right? I can go work on some refinement, I can work on backlog, or I can even pull more stories. Whoops, I want to don't use that one, I want to use this one. I could pull more stories in here and do more of this work, which would be really cool if I don't need it down here because I didn't use it. But what happens if I don't keep this down here and all of a sudden I have it, which means I have to get rid of some of this work or some of this work, which is usually the first to go, which means I'm not ever improving and getting better, or I have to cut back on what I promised in my sprint goal, which makes everyone upset. I think it's a lot easier to pull work in than pull work out. So how does this help us on reverse agile scaling? Well, I think here's the cool thing. This I can then say, ah, if I'm doing reverse agile scaling, and I got my multiple kinds of work here, my red work, and I got my team of four devs here, right, that work on all these different things. I might have my one star, right, my one star guy right here, or gal, let's just say gal, my one star person here, and they're really good at what this story is. They're the expert on this particular product. They've nailed it. Well, if they've done a good job in the sprint planning back here, detailing out this work, and down to the task level. And the task level, we're talking about small chunks of deliverables, right? We're talking something that takes two to three hours. If we've done that, they've already done the hardest part of the work here. They've done the detailed design and scooped out. Here's exactly what we need to build. We now have, in a sense, almost blueprints of what to build. I just need to execute it. These tasks here should be almost like a step-by-step -step diagram of what to do to build. And so we can just execute it. Now, some of that execution may still require this person's skills. So they're going to go out here and they're going to grab this task and they're going to grab this task because those are the hardest tasks in here. But if they did a decent job, this person should be able to grab this task or maybe this task. Not because they're the expert, because my star person here is the expert, right? But because that star person did a good enough job when they were sprint planning, they can go grab those tasks. And that way I can switch from specialization to specialization because not everyone's going to be equally as good on every product. So I need to have some good breaking apart the work here so that I can get people who aren't as good on that product to get some of that work done. Plus, I need them to become more knowledgeable on that product because I don't want a beer truck phenomenon here, right? That this person gets hit by a beer truck, then I'm hosed on that product. I got to spread the knowledge. And I'm doing that by forcing myself to break down the work into these small tasks that can execute it. Now, if they can even execute those small tasks, maybe they can come in and say, you know what, I, I really not doing that. So I'm going to go grab some of these tasks. I'm going to grab some of these tasks and help get this thing going on the future work. But by breaking down the work in the four categories, I can keep everyone relatively busy adding value over all the team in one of my four categories of work. So that's a great ad there too. So you really, on I think this is important on every Agile but with reverse agile scaling, this becomes even more important because I have such specialization here that I can sometimes fudge a little bit better when I have, a, say, a normal scrum or even a normal scaling situation. My fourth key is to make sure I'm delivering value. And I have this idea, it's an Earl term. I don't think I hear everyone else saying it, though there might be other terms that people use that mean the same thing. But delivering one value path at a time. What does this mean? Well, um, very common old tech uh, technique, and I've, uh, I've beaten it up a little bit, um, is called uh, uh, story mapping. You might recognize this as sort of a story map. These represent different color post-its, as it were. Um, but I do something a little different with this. So I'm calling it Earl story mapping, uh, just so that you don't get confused and read someone else's book and go, that's not what Earl does. And said, yeah, that's right, because I, I do something a little different. First thing I do is, is I start with this idea of what I call a berry. Berry again stands for begin and reason for interaction, right? And that's berry, B-E-R-I. A berry is something that someone wants to do with the product you're building. In this case, um, I travel, so <laughs> I used to travel. Uh, was checking in. And uh, then I did a logical model like you do in story mapping. And then down below are under like under locate here are different ways I could locate my reservation, right? I could do it by my reservation number, fly number, blah, blah, blah. Different things I did with my seat, different things I did with review, different things I did to confirm what I was doing. 
and then some printing or distributing ticketing thing, I called it, uh, ways I could ticket, right? So that's all thing. Now what happens is that sometimes, especially if I'm scaling up, what tends to happen is that we create the locate team and what their team is busy doing is creating, okay, let's, let's build all the ways we can locate. And we have the ticketing team and the ticketing team is building all these things. And we have this team that says, we're gonna cover these two areas and start building it all. And I don't have any way to check in until all these people are done. All these people are done. All these people, all these people, all has to be done before I can get what I really care about is checking in. And the idea is to switch that around a little bit and say, okay, really what I want to do is I want to create some way of checking in. What's the smallest thing I can build to give me an instance of this check-in? Because that's my berry, beginning and recent berry. That's what they want to do. And I can say, ah, oh, you know what? I can I can create a pathway through here. I can I can do the reservation number. In fact, I, I could skip that. I'll view it, confirm check-in, and print pointing best. That may be the smallest pathway I can get through. That is one value path, right? And then I can say, yep, I delivered that. You have one instance of checking in. But would I just ship that as the deliverable product? Probably not. I might say, oh, I want to do something new. Maybe, maybe I want to build another path. This way I want to actually confirm the seat. I want to view the reservation. I'm going to view check and print boarding pass and uh, print itinerary, right? And off we go. Oh, and then we want to start adding new features. So maybe I want to uh, uh, enter reservation number or frequent flyer number. I want to change seat, then confirm it. Uh, view few choice, then view reservation. I want to do luggage, confirm check-in. I want to collect fees, then print boarding pass thing, and then I create another pathway through it, right? So I can create all these different pathways, all these different ways of doing this one idea of checking in. But each way delivers value by itself. It's one way to do this thing I want to do. And we can prioritize those things. And what's critically important here, especially on the small thing, is that we don't get stuck halfway through saying, oh, we had a small project. They want to do check-in, and so we built eight different ways to locate, but they can't use it yet. So it sits there idle while we work on all these other products. No, it's more critically important than ever that we actually deliver something of value that creates a value path that we could ship it and say, it's done now, right? Now, hopefully we can get this done one sprint, but if it takes two sprints or three sprints, we're still focused on delivering that value path before we do something else. So if I have lots of value paths coming in for different products, what I really want to be able to do here is to go in and say, okay, as a team, let's do what we do to click get these tasks done. Check, check, check. So we can say, yes, that value path is done. And then on the next value path, we can start working it. Check, 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 check. And you know, maybe we someone has to go over and start working on value path three because of different skill sets, right? But we still want to complete value path two as quick as possible before we do a whole lot more on value path three until it's finally done as well. Because when it's done, then we can say we can walk away from it to a certain degree because it's done. They can actually use it to do what they need to do. And it's not sitting there in a limbo state because we really want to avoid that work in progress or work in process stuff, right? We don't want a bunch of half cooked things sitting there for a long time until they get in the next thing. So identifying these thin threads of value and you know, we can weave a lot of these threads into a larger tapestry of deliverable, but if we do these threads of value, we can walk away for a while at time and say, yes, there is still something valuable there instead of the potential for value in the future, right? So really focusing on those value paths. All right. And finally, my last bonus key here, if you will, is throughput over activity. And this is probably one you're already familiar with, but I think it really becomes prevalent here again as we talk about reverse agile scaling. How do we go from multiple products to thing? Because here's where we can keep people busy a lot of time. And one of the really ways to keep them busy is to work on partial work in progress, things that never get done. Lots of people running around switching from context to context. And it's worth thinking about the difference of these two words a little bit, right? When we think of throughput, when I think of throughput, what I really want to think about is value, over time, right? How much value am I delivering over time? And I don't mean potential value. I mean things that people can do, that beginning and reason for interaction, things that people could do that they couldn't do before, that's value, as opposed to busyness over time. 
And this is really looking internally. How well am I using my staff? Am I using them to 100% of capacity? Because this makes a big difference. Because this, this throughput says I can be okay with some idle time. Right? Throughput says I can be okay with that. Is that if someone's not doing something right now really important, maybe they're even taking time off to watch a webinar, that's okay because I'm focusing on getting my maximum throughput, not keeping everyone busy. Whereas activity is my sort of burn rate, right? Is everyone burning against a project at some time because I got to keep people busy all the time because I got to keep them really active? And again, it's inward focusing. And where this really begins to matter is that without idle time, I can't really change because I think if you focus on throughput and you, you're okay with some idle time because you're focusing on throughput, you have a chance to improve. Because people have this capacity, now they have some idle time, they can improve. And Tom, oh my gosh. Tom something rather, I'm gonna remember it here in five minutes. I had it earlier in the day and now it's gonna boom. But he wrote a book called Slack, Tom DeMarco wrote a book called Slack. Um, and basically he argued, I think he makes a great point, unless you have some capacity, some idle time, you cannot possibly change because you're so busy running around. So over your activity, you tend to be stuck in your own ways. So this is one of the biggest mindsets, especially when you're going to the 32 products one team, because it's so easy to stay in the activity buzzle. Buzzle. You can always keep shoving more work, more work, and more work at them that you don't have a chance to actually improve to get your higher throughput of delivering real value to customers in a period of time. And so the bonus key here is to continue to work on shifting that mindset from an activity-based mindset, how busy can we keep the staff, to a, how do we deliver value over time mindset? How do we increase our throughput of actual usable software to our clients? All right. So those are my four keys plus my bonus key. And what were they again, sort of wrapping up, what were we thinking about again? Um, I talked initially about this idea of the generic agile scaling. And the idea here is that we had some sort of mediator, that blob that helped us div divvy up the work, right? But the reverse scaling, the blob kind of thing doesn't work as well because it's not the team that we have to bring the blob, but it's all these product owners. So we, we, we need to push it forward a little bit, if you will. We need to push that back in the product backlog. And we did that in two different ways. One, we created a products backlog chief, right? This idea that there's going to be one person or one decision-making body that's going to choose among these different products about what's most important, even though each one's advocating on their own. But we allow them to advocate on their own with the idea of virtual product backlogs. I still want to have one presentation of the team, but there's going to be virtual backlogs back there so that each team can start saying, in my slot, in my lane, what's my priority? Right, And I want a piece of that pie. Well, how big is my piece? So I can start making some commitments and so having some rational discussions with our customers so I can show them where we're kind of stacking up in the order of business for the business. And then we said, okay, once I got that stack up, we can use that high investment zone of the backlog, right? Where we spend time getting things in a ready state to really push that forward to say, okay, here's what I'm gonna do to deliver value down that ready state. And when I do that, I'm still going to make sure that I'm delivering value. That is, I can do this work and it's done. That is, I haven't got a bunch of work in progress that's going to sit around because I used up my percentage of that one client, right? Because remember, this is percentage per quarter. It's not percentage per sprint. So we may have to work two sprints, but then they may not get something for the next four sprints because of their percentage of their budget. But I need to complete it so they have value and we can actually ship something on that overall. And then my bonus key here was the idea of switching the throughput and context around a little bit. So the, I have this idea of always going over throughput because throughput is what we really need to strive for, especially if we think about Agile, because if we deliver that value, that leaves us free to do something else as opposed to having everyone running around like chickens with their head cut off. All right. So that's it. Um, um, hopefully, maybe some questions came up. <laughs> my power hasn't gone out yet, which is amazing. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about that. Um, so I'm gonna invite Jesse back online here. Um, and All right, Earl, I'm questions here. For us. Okay, I'll go ahead and ask you the first question, Earl. Um, the question is, can we compare this method in productivity to anything else? This method in productivity in terms of, so measuring productivity and, and comparing it. So this is the fascinating question, and we should have another talk on that just on the idea of productivity. Measuring productivity 
and and just sort of sketch it out here. To measure productivity, you just got it's it's a simple formula, right? It's inputs over outputs, right? Inputs over outputs, straightforward. Unfortunately, we have a problem in software, and we have problems in two areas. First area is, what the heck are our inputs, right? Are they stories? Are they requirements? Are they tasks? Are they points? Um, are they features? Right? No one's come to a good idea of what our input really is that we can then compare it between two different projects because a story on one project with a team of 10 is going to be different than a story on another project with a team of three or a team of one. Right? And so, hmm, we got a, pro a little bit of problem there. And then the other problem is with the outputs. What is our outputs? Is it lines of code? Is it stories again? Um, is it enabled features? Is it revenue? Right? And so measuring productivity directly is really, really, really hard. In fact, I will argue it's darn near impossible in knowledge work because you're asking people, how productive is your thinking? All right? Um, we can measure how much code you learn, but does that code do any good? No. So we have to use some proxies instead. And I have a course on Agile metrics where I go into these proxies a lot more. Uh, but just to sum it up a little bit and uh, work I've done with like some other clients is the idea that we're going to look to things like customer satisfaction scores, right? So if, if you're keeping your customers happy, if they're wanting to queue up more work with you, you've got a good level of production. Is the team feeling confident and the sustain and they can go off? You look at the team happy score, if you will. That's another great sign. If they're burned out, a thing, production is going to squander, you know, thing. If they're really, if there's a deadline and they really want to meet it, they're going to be charged up. They're going to still going to be, they're going to say, yeah, we worked hard, but it was good. As opposed to, we worked hard and I just feel like I'm on a treadmill and nothing's going to ever end, right? And nothing helps that more than the throughput idea. So, well, I don't think there is a great way to measure productivity like this one versus the other one. What you really want to watch is, your customer happy factor, your team happy factor, and the collegiality among those product owners to say, yeah, I, I can I can well represent the stakeholders that I have to have, and it seems like a fair and reasonable process. All right, Earl, uh, let's move on to the next question here. Um, this one's kind of, has kind of a funny thing at the end, but I'll ask it anyway. It okay. says, what would, what would prompt an organization that just spent millions on safe training, consulting, consulting and coaching to listen to this? Is it heresy? <laughs> well, SAFE is trying to solve a different problem in this particular lecture, right? SAFE is trying to solve how do I get 25 teams? And really, if you if you just spent millions on SAFE, please call us. I spend millions on me. I would I would love it. But um the idea is safe trying to say and particularly safe is I have, I have 10 or more teams that are trying to work on one product, right? Or if I have five big products and 30 teams, that's what problem safe is trying to solve. This is the reverse problem. So I don't think it's heresy um, because you're not trying to solve the same problem. You got safe for that really big problem. I got to have 15 teams on this one product because it's just that big versus I have this one team that solves 25 products and you don't need a release train engineer, but we still have the idea of the value streams. I mean, that's what this picture is showing up a little bit here. If you think about it, right? Whoops, not that picture, <laughs> that picture. I mean, this is in a sense, a bunch of value streams. And so the concepts are roughly equivalent. What I'm doing differently here is I'm saying, let's take away a lot of that overhead with the different engineers and the different levels and start saying, because we only have a small organization here, right? This is a different kind of problem than what SAFE's trying to solve. So it's not total heresy. Um, I think SAFE is is perfectly fine when you're looking at those really big projects. Medium size, where you have three teams on one product, I think SAFE is a bit big for that. I like to use Nexus at that level. I think it's a little simpler, a little closer to Scrum. And of course, if you get down to one product backlog, one team, normal Scrum works fine. So heresy, I don't think so, um, just different problems. All right, thanks, Earl. Um, here's another question. How does money the, on me. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> how does the BERI approach work with the different unrelated products? Ah, uh, yeah, so the BERI approach work with different related on projects, BERI, beginning and reason for interaction. What it does is that what's, what's gonna happen 
um, and this is what happens almost all the time, right? Your customer is sitting out here and they're going to say, ah, I want a feature. And a feature is actually a solution. And so what the Barry thing says, is says, hmm, they've, they've come up with an idea. They want a new button somewhere. They want a new drop down. They've got something in mind. And what you need to go back in, this is where the Barry comes in. They're trying to accomplish something. And that's why they want this feature. They're doing something now and it's not working out quite the way they want to, and they want to do it better. They want to do whatever this berry is better. So you have to go back and say, what is that berry they're trying to do? And then make sure you understand that pathway so that when you build it and you incorporate, and if you incorporate their solution at all, you say, yeah, their, their solution is a good idea, but you there's lots of little things around that you have to get right because you really need to deliver the berry, not the solution. So what you do is you take their solution in, you figure out what is the thing they're trying to do with our product that that solution is trying to enable, right? And that they're trying to do better now because, and then say, okay, now that we understand it, let's form a value path that may use their solution, but also does all the little things to make sure they're going to get the value out of it. So they say, yes, that's exactly what we need instead of saying, because you've seen this, right? My clients see this all the time and you've seen it too, where you've delivered exactly what they asked for and they go, that's great, thank you, and I need this now. Because they really didn't do everything they need to do because they didn't think it through. They're not, that's not their job. It's your job, you're building the product, you have to think it through, and Barry is the tool that allows you to do that. All right, Earl, uh, another question. Is real value something you would measure in ways other than stories? Is real value so measure away other than stories? Yeah, I, I, I sort of hinted at this before. I like to use um, a couple different ones. Um, I, and, and, and they're not hard, fast measures. I mean, the best one is, do you get repeated business, <laughs> right? Are they asking for more? They love your business. They want more of what you're buying. That's the best value, right? Um, are we making sales? Are people buying it? That's the perfect one. But that's pretty lagging. Uh, a little less lagging is my two happy factors, my customer happy factor and my team happy factor. Um, because it's it's really interesting. One, your customer happy factor, right? And you're asking to rate yourself what you're doing on a customer happy factor or are these kind of things. You're saying on a scale of one to five, right? It's still surveys you sent out. Five being yay and five being, you know, frowny face, right? Um, I should make this smiley face, right? Um, where you want, and you're watching, and you're not you're not trying to get a perfect score, but what you're doing is this is zero, or this is, yeah, it would be like more like this. This is a bad drawing, like this, this is zero. You want, you're watching the trend, and you don't want to see it going down. If you're seeing it going way up, that's cool, but usually you're just trying to watch the trend, because what you can see, you're going to start seeing a trending down, you're saying, uh-oh, they're not getting value anymore. I'm starting to see this trend, and it's, it's still a pretty good indicator, because they're still telling you they're happy, but you're just seeing the happiness. You know, they're telling you they're happy. They're still buying your stuff, but they're, they're their little happy factor is going down. So it's still a pretty good indicator of a future state. Same thing with the team. The team often even knows it sooner than the customer, right? Because when I see the team happy factor, it's going to go down much sooner because the team stops believing that they're working on anything very useful. Right, they're thinking, oh, this is a bunch of garbage. This is just like, well, okay, if we have to, because some product owners, because one customer said, blah, 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 blah. The team happy factor is going to go down a lot faster because they, if they don't believe in the product, it's certainly hard to sell to the customer that they believe in the product. Now, I've seen it where the team happy factor goes way up and the customer goes down because the team was convinced it was a great idea. It was a horrible. So I like to have both of these, but the team going down is a faster indicator I'm losing value than the customer going down. Team going up is not a guarantee. It's a good step, but I got to be really careful and watch the customer saying, do they agree that this is actually something useful? And this is where that berry can come back really handy too, right? Because I want to tie anything that we're doing that's driving these changes to saying, what are they actually using the product for? Okay, Earl, um, here's another question for you. Is the Kanban method not a better fit for this kind of multi-application scenario than Scrum? The idea of time box sprint seems a little artificial here. Yo, Kanban can work fine. There's no no doubt about that. I'm, I'm not going to argue. The problem, the see, the issue I have with Kanban at this point is, I think we're talking maybe talking anything because what Kanban really is going to say here is that, is that I have my queue, right? And so half the keys here were just how do we form the queue correctly? 
Kanban has no saying on that whatsoever. Do I have a Kanban to form my Kanban queue for the team? Now we're doing Kanban regressively and it's getting kind of weird, but you can, right? So how do I form my queue? That's one problem here, right? And then what you do in a Kanban is you then model the workflow. Well, on these small projects, my workflow is almost always is to do in work and done. This is a boring workflow that Kanban is not giving me insight. Because what Kanban is designed to do is to say, hey, looking in that workflow, where are my bottlenecks? Where am I, where can I exploit things, right? Where do I need to change resources? Because each of these lines represents a set of policies that allow me to go from one to the other in a pull-based system, right? Until I meet the policies, I can't pull that in the next step. Plus, up here, I have WIP limits. And in this three-step flow, it's just boring as heck. So it's not buying much. Is a, is a visual work board handy on this? Sure. Do I need to adhere to two-week sprints? Well, what the two-week sprint is doing for me here that the Kanban isn't doing to me is giving me this idea of the part of the queue, which I call the high investment zone, high, high time, right? The amount of time I'm spending because now I have a way to measure and, and, and make sure I don't put too much work into that because I do have this fixed nature, whereas the Kanban is just going to keep flowing. So while the two weeks is artificial in terms of delivering, because I'm not going to let that stop me, right? I, I can keep flowing work constantly through the two weeks because my I'm not going to wait till the end of demo. I'm not going to maybe hold my retrospectives that frequently anymore because what's the point? Um, so I might flow like a Kanban, but I like this idea of having a constraint on how much effort should be putting into planning into the future, right? And keeping how much buffer should I keep? The two weeks allows me to put some numbers around that, some structure around that, so that I can then bring in lots of different projects and maintain that high zone here, which Kanban's not gonna help me do very well. All right, Earl, it looks like we have time for maybe one more question. Um, do you find that the practices you describe encourage more cross product capability among the scrum team or do product affinities among team members tend to stay entrenched? That's a great question. And what I've, 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 I've implemented these ideas with multiple clients um, uh, and it's kind of split at the moment. On the one hand, um, it really comes down to say, do you want to act as a team? Now, for a couple of the clients, they don't seem to want to act as a team. That is, they're going to maintain their deep specialties. Uh, the person isn't breaking it down. So when they have their, oh, maybe I can go to the picture of, of the people out there. Right here was my specialty one, right? When we go to look at the tasks, they're having a task that like says do design, which no one else can do, right? And the idea of breaking down the work is that I do the design as part of the team so that that cross-sharing happens. And, I, and if I create a task that says do design, then I basically lock the rest of the team out. I'm going off by myself. I'm doing it. No one else understands. So I have a couple of clients that are like that. But I like to, I, I'm, I'm happy to say that more of them have said, you know, let's act as a team. Let's do the design, not by myself, but this is the activity of designing when we break down all these tasks. That is the design activity. So I'm doing design in front of my coworkers, if you will. And that's how I come up with these tasks. And by doing design for my coworkers, I'm benefiting because I'm going to have a better design because my ability to try to explain it to the rest of my team just makes it better because they're, I'll realize things are silly as I'm telling them. But they're also learning it. And then they start seeing tasks that they can do. But because they're always participating in design, they're getting learning, they're learning more and more. And so I actually start building this more cross-functional team over time. It's not overnight. It doesn't do it in a month. But over time, I've seen these people become much more cross-functional. And they're telling me they're much happier this way because people can take days off, people can go to appointments, and they're not worried that they're slowing things down because they've gotten this cross-functional ability. So the majority are going there. But I'm not saying all of them have because some of them still say, you know, I'm only going to work on that product, no one, no one else. And they have a do design type task. Okay. All right, Earl. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And to all of our attendees, thank you for tuning in and sticking with us uh, till the end. Um, we'll have more free webinars coming up. So stay tuned for those announcements. 
Um, if you have any other questions or would like to learn more about these concepts and how they can help your organization, feel free to reach out to me or Earl or anyone here at Constructs uh, for more information. We really look forward to seeing you next time. And Earl, thank you again for the great presentation. You're welcome. And thank you everyone for me for attending. Um, my email address is up there too. So if you have any questions as well, you could drop me a line as well. Uh, or hello at constructs.com is a great place as well. So look forward to seeing you at another uh, webinar and hopefully hearing you on the phone as you tell me your stories about how you did reverse agile scaling.